Hey, Fearless community. I just want to thank you for listening to Fearless Tips and Talks. I am passionate about helping people overcome fear and anxiety, so much so that I wrote a book about overcoming severe panic and anxiety disorder called Nervous Breakthrough. You can find it on Amazon or you can order a signed copy with a personal message from me at fearlessunite.com forward slash books. And then you click the Fearless Store button. All of this will be linked in the show notes. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to Resilience in the Pews, a pivotal podcast series that dives deep into the intersection of faith, mental health, and the challenges faced within the sacred walls of our churches. Welcome back to Resilience in the Pews. Today, we are going to talk about what it's like to be othered, which is the title of this episode. So we're nearing the end of the series, and I do have to just admit that of all the books that I've read to prepare and the interviews that I've gotten ready for to prepare for the Resilience in the Pews series, I have to tell you that Janai Almond's book, Othered, Finding Belonging with the God Who Pursues the Hurt, Harmed and Marginalized, has been the most surprising. Now, when I say surprising, it's because I literally felt like she was articulating things that I've observed or seen and heard and experienced, but I didn't have the words for them. Mm. I had a chance to read an advanced copy of the book and it was cool because I sent her a bunch of pages highlighted up because I just couldn't highlight enough. It seemed like every sentence after every sentence was like, yes, yes, yes. And it was weird because I felt exposed, but in a good way, I felt seen and, and valued and love loved. And, And this book was such a gift to me because I felt like God was saying to me, daughter, I see you. You're not crazy. All the pain, the anxiety, the fear, the doubt that you've experienced inside the four walls of some local churches, you're not alone. So Janai, I just want to thank you. I know it's not easy to step out and share your story so vulnerably. And I'm confident when this book hits the world, and I think, when does it hit the world? Tell me again. June 25th. June 25th. I believe it's going to have the same effect that it did on me on others. So I just want to congratulate you for writing such a powerful and impactful book. And welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. That is to hear so many kind words in a row is really a gift. So thank you so much. And thank you for having me on. I'm excited to get started. Okay, well, let's start with Othered. It's Mm -hmm. the title of the book, and um, it's a little bit nuanced. So can you explain why you decided to call the book Othered and what does it mean? Yes, I, oh, okay. So Othered is really at the root if we're defining it. And it's so hard to define something that kind of has its own cultural, like, it, it, it exists out there as its own creature. But the way in which I define othered is at minimum, it's exclusion. Mm. But it really is more than that. It is to be dismissed, um, devalued, dehumanized, or just considered less than to a group of people. And so really, if uh, if I can nerd out for a li- just a quick second, it it really has to do with this idea of in-group and out-group biases. Um, so in social identity theory, you know, there's an in-group and there's an out-group. And typically that language is just morally neutral, morally neutral, like the in-group. It's, it's just kind of like, you know, I identify as Filipina American, or I identify as a Texan, Texans would be my in-group. But when I start looking at my in-group as the more supreme, Mm. the more uh, powerful, um, and my power or the power of the group depends on the disempowerment of the out-group, whoever the out-group is, that would be othering. It's exclusion, but there's a value statement in there as well that says, you are different. And not only are you different, you are less than. And that's Mm -hmm. really, really painful. 
And the the reason why I chose it for the title of the book, I know that there are so many books coming out now about, um, you know, religious trauma, spiritual abuse. And I think so many of them are adding very wonderful just dialogue to the entire conversation. But what I wanted to kind of, or the particular angle that I wanted to bring to the table is that, I, you know, I came to the church. I wasn't a believer. Uh, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And I remember feeling so very othered by Christians in my community for um, for instance, even even by believing family members, there were criticisms aimed at my parents for keeping Buddhas in our home. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mom is Filipina. She's not Buddhist, but that is just kind of a an icon of Filipina culture. And you just kind of bring that stuff over. It's kind of similar to other like memorabilia that, I mean, think about all the things hanging in your home. You know, do you worship the picture of the tree in your house? Do you worship the, you know, the painting that you have? No. And so we had a Buddha statue and it was just art in our home. And that was one way that my mom in particular had experienced being othered um, by other Christians. I was I, born and raised in Southeast Texas. And so very conservative Christian area. Um, didn't really know what to do with people who are different. Um, And so I kind of brought that perspective to the book of being this very different um, just child growing up, straddling cultures, but also the ways in which I experienced othering in my former church and how ultimately I had did I had done everything I could to fit in to the majority culture status quo for years. And still, it wasn't enough to fight the toxicity of conformity pandered as unity in Christ or in the harmful assimilation, the harmful silencing. I assimilated and it just wasn't enough, especially when, um, you know, faithfulness called me to speak out. Um, So I I chose othered because I, I feel like it brought the it brought together the sense of like exclusion I felt but ultimately how wrong that is because we should find belonging in God and also I think from my perspective and for those who read the book I think they'll get this too I ultimately think the othered are the blessed ones they are the ones who have the eyes to see how harmful um this culture of exclusion is in the church I mean ultimately you know the Israelites were supposed to be a set apart people and the new Testament church was supposed to be a set apart, you know, a, a, a peculiar people. We were supposed to be weird to the culture around us. Um, and so I felt like othered kind of beautifully encapsulated all of that. Mm. So let's get into your story of being othered. I mentioned mm-hmm. in the opening, um, I highlighted quite a bit inside mm-hmm. of your book and the first quote that I highlighted said this, I have learned that when you call those misusing power to account, they will continue to misuse power to exile you. Explain what you mean by that. And how does this go along with your story of the misuse of power? Yeah. So if we, if we want to get really reductive, and I think it might be helpful, I think misuse of power is baseline sinning. So if you if you want to reread that statement, I have learned that when you call those who are sinning to account, they will continue to sin mm. to exile you. Mm. So at its base, no one wants to be called out for their sin, right? Um, but especially when when you are, I, I wanted to frame everything in the book within the within power dynamics. So when you tell someone who's missing, misusing power, especially a, a very pow- powerful pastor, leader, any, anyone who has the capable to influence vi- like so many people in your community, um, if you tell them that they've done something wrong, um, it, they may not be able to deal with the shame or the guilt of that. I think I mentioned, you know, in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve couldn't deal with the shame of the question. They they were invited to tell the truth of their story. And then they kept kind of doing this weird PR spin um, 
Adam said, it's the woman you gave me. And then Eve was like, it's the serpent. They never really owned their own yeah. stuff, their own part. And so I feel like in the same way, um, the people we call to account who are misusing power, they don't really own their own stuff. Instead, they double down and they think about how can I continue to misuse power, especially if they have so many people who listen to them and who they influence to discredit this one person, this one naysayer, so that life can go on. And I mean, ultimately, it is a, it's a sin issue. And we all have power. It's just some of us have more power than other people. And sometimes people with the most power, instead of empowering others, they clobber them. And yeah, I think it's just a, it's a, it's a sin issue at the root. If we, if we want to be really boring about it, it's a sin issue. Um, I just tried not to use the word sin so much in the Bible because I wanted to specifically name the sin as mm. misuse of power. Yeah. Uh, I was just learning in James, it talks about when you know something's a sin and you choose to do nothing about it, you are then sinning. Mm. And so I just wonder if, you know, what would life look like if we called each other higher? If we called each other, whether you're in a position of power or not, like just what would this beautiful level of accountability look like if we were just open to say, you know what, I'm not perfect and I am going to make mistakes. And that when someone lovingly comes to you and, you know, I've read your story, you, you didn't do it like a raging lunatic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had a moment where you were very angry, but like you, you did it in a way that was honorable. And so we, I, I just feel like if we are honest and honorable with what we're feeling and we approach people and they're, they don't have a category or they don't, they just want to push you away or exile you away, then there's your answer. You know, yeah. there's your answer. And I just, I wish that people would look to accountability as a blessing, as a way to grow instead of just, we've got to exile these people and shut them up as quickly as possible. Yeah. As a way of love. Um, ultimately, if I, if I really was choosing me, I would have walked away a long time ago. Mm, that's good. But I loved these people. I really did. And I stayed and I stayed and I stayed and I thought, oh, we're friends. Like they're not only my pastors and my brothers, but they're my friends. Surely they'll, they'll hear me. Mm. And they've talked so much about how we have a flat hierarchy. We're all peers. And in those moments, I learned quickly, I am not a peer. I am a peon and I am less than subordinate. And I, they don't really want to hear what I have to say. They want to, they want me to fall in line. Mm. And of course I, I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> And so that is just a beautiful segue into my next question to you. That was painful. Mm. When you think someone is a brother, when you think someone is a friend, when you think someone is a pastor, when you look up to the position that they hold in your life and then to bring them honest truth with love and then to be clobbered, like you said, or mm. to come to the realization that I'm really just a peon. You talk about naming your ache mm. and I just that was a beautiful chapter for me because I, I think for so long I've been taught forgive, 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 you know, you, you, as a Christian, we're supposed to forgive, but not realizing there's all these different stages of forgiveness. And I think that first stage is naming your ache. Why are you hurt? You know, putting a name to it was so important. So explain your naming process and uh, why you believe it's so important in the healing process. Yeah, I wrote the book knowing, again, there's so many great books coming out on this particular topic, but I knew that I wanted to define the terms I was using in at the front of the book so that we could kind of clear what I was and was not talking about. And I feel like I, I keep it very general in many ways. It, it doesn't necessarily exclude anyone. I use words from church hurt to religious trauma to othering to spiritual abuse. So I, I spent time naming those things uh, at the front of the book because that was really step one of my journey. And it took a long time for me to name what was happening 
because I loved these people so much. I I trusted them so much. And so to name anything abusive almost felt like a betrayal of my love for them. Wow. Um, but I did not realize that that's what abuse does. Abuse makes you think, you as the survivor think that you're in the wrong. And really, it's not naming these things. It's not you betraying them. Naming them is coming to the realization that they betrayed you over and over and over again. And so it, it was, huh, ooh, it. I've described it like this. When you're in the middle of it, um, I, for instance, I do talk about hurricanes in the book to kind of name this dynamic. But when you're, I've lived through so many, when you're in the middle of the hurricane, your power's out, or um, have you ever seen those new bro news broadcasts where they're, they're talking about a hurricane and then there's the guy in the studio and the guy on site. Yeah. So there's like the guy in the studio will say, we're going to throw it back to our man in the field. And the man in the field is barely talking. He's like trying to fight the wind. He's trying to say it's like it's really in, like insane and wild and things are flying around. He's not really coherent because he's literally in the middle of the storm. Whereas the weatherman or weather person in the in the studio will say, you know, the it's it's at 120 miles per hour, like giving you all this data, all these names, all these facts. When you're in the middle of the storm, it's hard to actually accumulate the data to actually pinpoint where you are, what is happening. You're just trying to survive the wind speed, the turmoil, the chaos. And so it took a while for me to name things because I needed distance and time and I just needed to cry I think I really needed several good <laughs> few weeks of crying maybe months of crying to and when I talk about crying I'm talking about the sort of crying where um like most of the time you see kids doing this like they can't breathe um like just totally beside myself um, because I was so confused and then this is so funny. Are you familiar with Chuck DeGroat's book, When Narcissism Comes to Church? Yes, ma'am. Yep. That book was pivotal, pivotal in helping me name, you know, even the nuances of narcissism, because I wouldn't have typically called my pastor um, or even my executive director I mentioned in the book that. But this is funny. I or It's not funny. It's just really, um, I feel like God left me breadcrumbs to help me find my way out of the storm, out of the wilderness, out of the forest, whatever we want to say. So I had um, my sit down conversation with my pastors officially telling me that I was being off ramped from the church, which was just their fancy uh, phrase for um, letting me go on March 16th, 2020. If you go on uh, Amazon and look at the hardback copy of Chuck DeGroat's book, you'll learn that it was released the very next day, March wow. 17th, 2020. And so, and then also more books that year. And I just started reading. Typically, this maybe this is just high control religion. Typically, I read the books that were like sanctioned by the church. Um, you know, read these books on theology. And I just branched out and I thought I'm going to read whatever I need to read so that I can help calm this inner chaos. And so it took a long time to name my, and I think it's so important. And I, I'm going to say this so many times, I mentioned this in the book, but you can't, a doctor cannot heal a disease he has not named or a disease that she does not recognize. Yes. So if, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe they'll accidentally heal it, but to be effective, to be direct, they need to know, you know, this is X. So you need this treatment. I didn't know what treatment I needed or what, you know, healing I needed or what needed to be healed until I actually named what happened to me. Um, and I could see the symptoms, you know, there's this lack of trust. There's this um, inability to trust myself even. So what does that even mean? And then I realized being able to name that, I realized, oh, like trauma actually fragments all of these pieces within you. And so I really encourage people to name what is happening within them or here, my whole, my whole heart is never to tell people what to think. It's to provide language. So that right. your discernment is empowered, because I'm not going to be standing with you holding your hand as you walk through life, 
So here's language to empower your discernment. And so I think naming the ache is so important so that you don't walk, or I didn't want to walk into another church and experience the same pain again. And so I just needed to give myself space to, you know, rest, learn, and wisen my eyes so that I could see the red flags better in the future. Yeah. You do talk about this in the book and, and it's the science of what your body experiences yeah. when you are in these things. And um, I, I like to tell people that your body often knows before you know. Mm -hmm. And and so I, when I was walking through some of my church hurt experiences, I remember just like crazy anxiety and knots yes. in your, you know, like the butterflies in your stomach and mm -hmm. not the good butterflies before, you know, to, to give you a little boost of like, this is like the, like you feel like you're going to vomit and doesn't go away for days <laughs> kind of thing. Yes. And so, you know, those you touch, do you touch on that in the book, but man, those are great things to pay attention to too. Like, and, and will help you name your ache. I mean, I feel like if your body is feeling it first, then it should be a warning sign. Hey, there's a smoke alarm going off here. Something's not yes. right. Something's not right. And to pay attention to that. And I think we're accustomed just in our culture, just to blow through things, mm -hmm. swipe it under the rug, keep going, pull up your bootstraps a little higher, you know, don't pay attention. Just be a boss, babe, keep going, keep going, keep going. And really, Really, that's a beautiful internal blessing that the Lord is saying, hello, something's not right here. Something's not right. Yes. Like the, the, the idea to slow down is, has been so conditioned out of us that it's actually very harmful. And I'm not going to speak for everyone's faith tradition, but the, the environment that I came out of was very intellectual. It was very heady. You stayed in your head a lot. And so we weren't really trust or we, we weren't um, taught to trust our body, to learn how our body responds. Um, I, even now my, my um, therapist, I specifically wanted to work with my therapist because she's a somatic experiencing therapist, mm -hmm. meaning she helps me stay in my body. But Christy, I'll tell you this, this is not in the book. I, um, when I worked on staff, I started having so many, uh, like just issues with my stomach. Yes. Something is wrong. Um, something is wrong. <laughs> and I thought I was eating, like I thought I was developing some allergies. And so I saw a GI doctor who did x-rays and I started an elimination diet. I cut out gluten. I cut out dairy. I cut out cheese, my beloved cheese. I cut out, um, meat products in general. I like, or beef products. I cut like, and I came to find out later, I didn't know this until later that your, uh, there's a nerve in your body that connects. It's the vagus nerve. It connects your brain to your stomach. It, it kind of runs through the center core of your body. And I realized it was anxiety that was causing this gastrointestinal distress. My poor GI doctor said, you know, you've got so many different systems that are affected. I don't know. He just kept saying, I don't know. And that's so disheartening to hear when you're at a doctor. Sure is. I was like, man, there is, some, there is something though. And he said, I don't know. Um, and I realized, oh, it's my body revolting to the stress of my environment and the stress is trying to leave my body, but I've not given it a way out. Wow. And so, yeah, I, it, it is so important to, we've been so conditioned to not trust your feelings. Um, your body's bad. Your body is evil. Um, and that's not true. If bodies were evil, Jesus would have never come down in a body. He wouldn't have been God with us incarnate. So there's something good about our bodies. There's a wisdom in there. Um, Hillary McBride has a great book called The Wisdom of Your Body. There's a wisdom in your body. Um, it is the very temple that the Holy Spirit dwells in. It cannot be all bad. And if anything, I think this the internal science of our system is one way that our Holy, the Holy Spirit tries to communicate to you that something so is not right, you know? So yeah, so good. I'll resonate. Mm -hmm. And it's why, I mean, I'm the often known as the fear and anxiety girl, right? And as yeah. I launched this resilience in the pews, I had some people like, what does this have to do? Like, what does church hurt have to do with fear and anxiety and depression? I was like, oh, you just wait. <laughs> like, listen, listen, yeah. like being in an environment 
where your body is revolting, like yeah. the outcome is anxiety. So yeah. anyway, thank you for sharing. That's so good. Okay. Another great quote you say, uh, Jesus spent most of his earthly ministry upsetting the powers of his time and flipping the tables of those profiting off of the vulnerable, mar marginalized and oppressed. Mm. So for those that would kind of like, they're like, really, Jesus did that? Like, seriously, like the, if they want to go study that out a little bit more and, and kind of gather what you're trying to say there, where would you, where would you send them? And, um, why do you think if, if he spent most of his time calling this kind of stuff out, how come we don't hear more messages about this? How come we don't hear more about the hypocrisy that's happening inside of the churches? What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. Let me answer that last part first. I think okay. we don't hear about it. We don't hear about it. And so now I want to say and acknowledge there's always nuance to everything I say. Um, I will, I will, if there's anything, I will always, I try not to use always everything every time, but there's always nuance. Um, so I don't want to overgeneralize, but there are faithful pastors and preachers and teachers who are saying these things but because they're, they tend to be quiet sages who are present with their people, they, they tend to not be loud. They tend to be um, those who foster shalom. We're not going to hear them because the noise and chaos of those who want us dysregulated are, tend to be so much louder. They get our attention more. So I wanna say that, but we don't hear many messages about this because Often Christianity has been Christian Christianity and God. These are very power religion itself in general. I just read a fiction book. It has nothing to do with anything that we're talking about today, but it was, I thought it was very poignant. Um, the authors it was speaking through the character. She said, you know, if you want to control a population, um, a, a cunning leader will connect their, the, the agenda to a religion, to God, and will inject it into a faith system. And using that faith system, that cunning leader can control a population. So we often don't hear messages about, I mean, again, qualifying, we not all people, but we don't tend to hear these messages because there's a different agenda or um, pastors are fallible. And so they, um, I can't, I'm sure there's some people here who know the pain of having their story used from the pulpit or being kind of um, gossiped about from the pulpit. Like the pastor's saying this specific thing because I upset him for whatever reason. And I feel like I'm being pointed at like the pulpit's powerful and it's a powerful way to pander a particular message. And so that is the very, that, that whole pandering, um, positioning, manipulating, that's the thing that Jesus wanted to upset. And so, of course, if they want to use the pulpit as a platform of power to control people or manipulate people or guilt people, um, sometimes it might not be, you might not perceive it as control or manipulation, but guilting and shaming people into doing a particular thing, um, Jesus would have flipped their tables. And so, of course, we're not, they're not going to speak to it. Um, but for those who uh, want to study more of that, I would say go to the Gospels, go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and retrain your eye to read. So, so often we are encouraged. America is a very individualized nation. So when we read, you know, uh, I put this in the book, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so sometimes I've, I've been a part of uh, of Sunday morning gatherings where the preacher would say, insert your name into that. And so a communal reality becomes very individualized and it removes the sociological implications that I am a part of a people. And not only that, but um, I'm a part of a, a very dynamic a group of people that has learned to build walls instead of longer tables. And so when you, when I went back to read, I realized Jesus did spend time, you know, he sat with both Pharisee, powerful people, and he sat with sinners, those considered unclean as well. But he, when he brought healing, he brought healing to those who were sick. 
to those who were ostracized. It was an ostracized woman that was bum rushing him in the crowd, trying to touch the edge of his garment. And so I would encourage people to, when they read the scriptures, we're so conditioned to make them applicable today. Read it as a story. Read it as a story and keep it oriented in its own sociological reality. Name, like, before I think you started recording, like, you know, now that I've lived this story, now I see the world through the lens of power dynamics. I see who has the most power to change their culture in their particular time. Go back and read the Gospels. Who had the power to change things and didn't? Whose tables did Jesus flip? He didn't flip the tables that were... Um, the disenfranchised and the ostracized were trying to eat. So I would say, I would just encourage people to go back and read the story as a story and not for a particular life application. Just read it as who was God, who, who was God incarn incarnate choosing to be with and how was he ministering to them? You know, for instance, one story is like he, Jesus was granting rest on the Sabbath, or he was healing people on the Sabbath is what they, they say. But one pivotal shift for me was realizing the person of rest embodied in, in, in God, God incarnate. He was extending rest on the Sabbath. So he wasn't sinning or breaking any laws. He was actually trying to grant greater rest and Sabbath and shalom to people who had none in their sociological context. And who was the most upset? The powerful people of the day. They were so upset that he was making that the ostracized well. And so, yeah, I would just encourage people to go back and read and sit back and, or, or even the Ignatian method would encourage them, put yourself like, pretend you're standing on the street of this of this story watching this happen like what would you notice you know we have to reread with different eyes oh so good. yeah so good why do you think it's so important for people to use their voices to speak out about the misuse of power i think mm -hmm. as i have um gathered the courage to speak out and say uh part of my journey my experiences um, it's a little lonely because yeah. people uh, misunderstand. They only want to hear what they want to hear. They're not maybe back to our initial question. They're not ready to take, hold themselves accountable. So um, why do you think it's so important for people to use their voices, even if they're going to stand alone? Yeah. Well, I will first say, I'm sorry that you've had to experience that because I know what that feels like too. And that is, it's awful. You've, it, as you do it, you realize no one else is going to back me up or no one's going to want to, when you realize that no one wants to stand with you, it is, oh gosh, like a piece of me died. So I'm sorry that I'm sorry for anyone who's listening, who had to experience that because it really, it really does feel like a piece of you dies. But I will say, I will caveat and say, um, I think everyone speaks up in their own way. I don't want to say everyone will speak up in identically the same way. I don't want to overgeneralize anything. I will also say that people will speak up at different times or just because you can't speak up now. So many people are, are forced to sign, for instance, like non-disclosure agreements, yes. especially if they were staff members and they're they're you know, survival as a family, the money that helps them feed their kids, all of that is contingent upon signing this non-disclosure agreement. And whether or not you sign that agreement, um, I mean, some people maybe don't have any qualms with an NDA, but some people have to, have to, have to sign because that's how they take care of themselves. And so I don't want to shame anyone for not being able to speak up or use their voice either. Um, because that was a pretty terrible situation to be put in. And I would say that was really unethical of the church to do. I won't get into that, but I feel like there are a lot of people who say great things about that or poignant things about that. But um, I would say that um, if you're healing, your job is, if you're you know still sobbing, crying, um, your job is just to take care of your own mental capacity. Wait until you have the space within yourself and the mental capacity 
before you feel like you have to say anything. You know, whenever you're so angry and you try to like like argue with someone and it's almost like I can tell I'm making this worse because I'm being argu argumentative with this person and I'm almost proving them right if they call me quote unquote crazy or hysterical and I'm almost so triggered and like angry and livid and just kind of rattling the first words without mindfulness off the top of my tongue and I start to prove them right. I, I mean, I know what that feels like. And so I, in those moments, I would say, if you feel that way right now, just breathe, just breathe and let um, the breath of God fill you and create more space in you. Because so often when we start speaking up, sometimes we can actually unintentionally do the harm that was harmed. Like we can start dehumanizing another person attacking their humanity instead of their behaviors that were harmed. You know what I mean? So I would, I, so many caveats, but I do think for those who have leadership positions, for those who influence people, for those who pastor congregations or write books or attend a church who have pastors who are maybe committing bad behaviors behind the scenes for people who have space within themselves to speak up. I think it's so important to speak up because those who are being most harmed are vulnerable people who feel like they cannot use their voice and their choice. And speaking actually helps. Uh, it is the way in which the body of Christ heals itself. It's mm -hmm. them naming, like, again, like naming the wound so we can mend it, not so that we can shame the pastor or the leader who is commit committing these bad behaviors. It's so that we can mend this rupture. And if we leave it unnamed, it will re remain unreconciled. It's not just reconciled if someone forgives. Like It has to be named, lamented, like seen to, triaged, sat with before anyone can forgive it and just reconcile it. And so... I would say absolutely. Um, again, we can we can paraphrase that question. You know, why is why do you think it's so important for people to use their voices to speak out about sin? You know, like if you would do this with sin, with anyone's sin. So often we talk about the sin of this. I'm not trying to over trivialize, but I do think this is like yelling at women on the internet for wearing yoga pants to the grocery store. We, I feel like there is a whole swath of Christianity so much more like armed to the teeth to attack that specific sin than they are. Like that is almost more offensive to them than someone being abused within the church. So why is it important for people to use their voice? Because it's actually rupturing the family of God, the body of Christ. It's keeping us in chaos, you know, um, the shalom is more than just peace it's actually wholeness holiness healing a reconciliation within ourselves and within the body and we can't have shalom if abuse is in our ranks because abuse is keeping us fractured so yeah i talked a little bit about um being in a counseling session where the counselor talked to me you know christy you can't forgive what you haven't acknowledged. And you talk about lamenting in your book. Mm -hmm. And I had a mentor say to me, uh, well, cause I, 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 I had a Christian say to me, you need to forgive, you need to forgive, you need to forgive. Like you are, you're sinning by not forgiving. And so I was processing this out with my counselor and the counselor just kind of said to me, well, you should have said to that person, don't talk to me about forgiving until you've made space for my lamenting. And I was like, oh, and so it's this space and you talk about reconciliation and you just mentioned that. And it, and it's like, we just want to get to the forgiveness part as Christians. Yeah. Right. But we don't realize that there's this whole other space of like, Hey, you've got to value my pain. I have to value your pain. We've got to be able to have a dialogue about this. We have to be able to 
lament alongside of each other. We have to be able mm-hmm. to name the ache. And there's just this whole space in between where we just want to skip to the forgiveness part where we haven't worked through this other part. So why do you think it's so important to save space for people's lamenting? I think it's so important because it was modeled in Jesus's death and his resurrection. Why does Holy Saturday exist? You know, like Jesus was crucified crucified on Cru- Good Friday. And you know, why why did why did it foretell that he would be like that he would raise again later? Like why not the next day? What about the people who were close to him, who loved him, who sat and laughed with him and rejoiced with him and wept with him? as as he lived you know how did they feel on holy saturday that entire period of time where there was no hope he was just gone i yeah i think i i want us to sit with that i think it's the I, 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 maybe it's called the u diagram i'm not familiar with their work but i, I, I believe another um, trauma organization, I believe it may, might be Kathy Lorzel with the Allender Center who created the U diagram, which is essentially what I'm talking about is there's this Holy Friday, or I'm, I'm sorry, Good Friday moment. And then there's this dip, which is Holy Saturday. So it's, there's this U and then there's Resurrection Sunday. But so many people just want to build a bridge and go over kind of the crater, the nuclear crater crater created by our grief and lament. We want to build a bridge from point A to point B without having to deal with the nuclear fallout or the grief or the lament of Holy Saturday. So they build, uh, you know, it's a, I think I talk about this in the book also, you know, people say Sunday's coming. They say Sunday's coming before Friday's even happened. Um, but really, I, I think like we don't give space for our holy Saturday moments. Um, we want to build a bridge so that we don't have to dive deep down into the depths of Sheol. And I think in God leaving us holy Saturday, he left space for our laments. He knew that our grief mattered and he sat in that with us. In so many ways. Um, and, and lament, I believe, is modeled so much throughout this. Even in the Old Testament, it's all over the place. We There is space for lament throughout the Bible, but it's usually not the most fun sermons to preach. And so sometimes we don't hear so much about them. But I knew that I wanted to create a whole chapter about making space or room for lament um, in the book. I think we could say safe space for the dip. Yeah. space for, for yeah. the you, you know, like that's, that was a powerful illustration. Thank you for saying that. Okay. Many people uh, will try to explain that pr- prophecy is not needed anymore, that mm-hmm. it's an old Testament thing and we don't need any more. We don't need prophetic, prophetic voices in many ways. I feel like you're a prophetic voice. Mm-hmm. So how would you respond to that? That because we have the Holy spirit now, we, we don't need prophetic voices. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't share this in the book, but I also, I knew when I wrote this chapter and I knew I wanted a prophetic voices chapter in the book, but I knew I I needed to be careful because I came to faith in a tradition that actually brought in like prophets from like who were traveling prophets on the road. I now realize that I think that there was some spiritual abuse and some misusing of the Holy Spirit happening. I haven't fully unpacked that, but I just kind of know that is part of my story also. And so I don't want to take the gift of prophecy and say, God is saying this. I knew that I needed to reframe it or not reframe it, but like root it in what I was seeing in scripture. And so prophecy, so often we think of that as fortune telling. Uh, I'm going to tell you your fortune. Um, prophecy is like simply truth telling. It is telling you the truth. Um, apocalypse, what we call the apocalypse, um, the Greek word for apocalypse, we think it's like the ending of all things. Really, that is the Greek word for re- revealing, which is why revelation is called revelation. 
The truth is continually being revealed. So often we're taught that there's an absolute truth, like this truth is absolute, it's unshakable, it is unchanging. And I believe there is a universal truth that applies to all of us in our humanity, in our brokenness, in the fractures that we feel in a broken world. I believe there is a universal truth. I believe, and this is a Hebrew um, concept, that the truth is not absolute, but it is continually being revealed to us, which is why the whole Bible ends with revelation. There's more being revealed. Think of it this way. I'm, I'm taking a class on the reformers right now, and Martin Luther would say like he absolutely had everything right in that moment as he was telling, you know, that he kind of railing against the Catholic Church. Now, several centuries later, I would say there are ways in which I can articulate Luther's theology to him and tell him how I disagree. And I believe that there is a continuing revelation, which is why we are to be humble. I can't say I know absolutely this right now because I don't know what God will reveal to people in the next 400 years after I die. And so prophecy is really truth telling. I just want to start with that. Um, but the gift of prophecy, when you go back and actually, I did a great um, Bible study, I think a year and a half ago, Beth Moore is in my town and she actually walked um, a, a group of us the several weeks through the minor prophets and essentially what was happening in the minor prophets. Like those are books that we tend to not cover, but really it, it is, it, I highlight, I really thought my book on prophets was maybe going to be Ezekiel because he has that really powerful, you know, don't feed on the sheep, Ezekiel 34. And I thought this is going, this is like going to be the banner. And it totally wasn't. I shifted and realized the book of Amos is essentially Amos himself is doing or was doing what many of us are trying to do today. Amos went to the leaders and to the priest Amaziah to say, like, you are plundering your own people. You are harming your own people. These nations all around you are fighting with one another, but they're not fighting their own people and plundering them for their own power and pleasure. Israel is like, like Amos kind of poignantly, if you go, you can kind of read that. And, and I realized, and he's not telling them to condemn them. He's calling them back to goodness. He's calling them to remember everything that God had brought them through, how he gave them this land, how like, and so Amos is really just saying, remember who you are. This is not who you are. Like that end of the Moana <laughs> movie. This is not who you are. This is not who we are supposed to be. So prophecy, again, is more than just like trying to predict the future. It's saying, I know the future is going to be even more fractured if you continue in this behavior. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. And I don't want that for the other people who are potentially going to be hurt. And so I I knew that I needed a prophecy chapter. I do need to um I need to get pay homage to I believe it's Scott and Laura McKnight. They had a great quote on prophetic action in their yes. book, A Church Called Tove, but also uh Professor Soon Chan Ra, who wrote prophetic laments. I mean, I owe, I am standing on a foundation very firmly laid by other scholars and theologians. And so, um, yeah, but I thought this was worth putting in there because, mm -hmm. because I think we're doing it. And I'm just going to say that that's what we're, many of us are doing. And I wanted to empower other people to feel like if they wanted to speak, but have been told so often that it's sinful to speak up, I want to actually reveal to them how biblical and how biblically rooted it is and how historically um, marginalized prophets become because they tend to speak truth to power and the powerful don't like it. Hey friends, I just wanted to take a moment to interrupt to let you know that the Fearless Tips and Talks podcast is part of a ministry called Fearless Unite. Our mission is to help you find freedom from fear and anxiety in a world that feeds it. We are rolling out a new initiative called Soul Shepherd, which is a mental health advocacy movement in our community. We are very serious about decreasing the mental health 
crisis that we are facing. And we're going to do this first by starting with teenage girls, one body, soul, and spirit at a time. If you want to learn more about our Soul Shepherd Initiative, go to fearlessunite.com forward slash soul shepherd. This will also be linked in our show notes. Now, back to the interview. I find it just fascinating that the people that God has allowed me to interview through this series, they don't know each other, but they talk about each other as Mm -hmm. people of wisdom that have helped them in their journey. Laura Berenger was the second interview on the Resilience in the Pews podcast, and we discussed a church called Tove. So friends, anybody that's listening right now wants to go back and grab Mm -hmm. that uh, message. It was crazy, crazy powerful. You said, I, I, this was offline and it's just, it keeps burning. So I'm just going to go there, um, burning on me to ask you, but you said often when you see that someone is marginalized or devalued or isn't, um, you know, just isn't, um, held to the esteem that they need to be, uh, you said that you can often find that there's other abuse behind behind it. And I guess what I'm trying, I hope I'm making sense here, but like that, if you see someone being devalued, you can trace it and find that there's probably more going on behind Mm -hmm. the scenes. And you use this example as a pastor that you knew, um, was treating people not right. And then come to find out that he was actually abusing his wife. And so Mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is I, I, I'm starting to put the pieces together and I wonder if you have any science or study because you're a very studied person here, um, that with the whole women in ministry thing, yeah, women are not esteemed to be able to share the word of God, to be able to treat, teach, be, use their prophetic voice, use their, uh, you know, gift of shepherding or teaching. And what I'm starting to realize is when there is a church that has that firm stand on not allowing women to do X, Y, Z, there's often more behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Would you agree or disagree with that? Do you, do you see that there's some science behind that kind of, um, mistreatment of women? Yeah. I I mean, I would say it's not only, not only a science, but that's our, that's our story. Like I see that happening. If a feminist scholars of the Bible would say, um, when they read the scriptures, they're reading it also through feminist critique. A man had to say this thing at this time because they would have never let a woman say this, even though they're probably very like so many women who could have said that thing at this time, but she would have never been heard. Um, or, you know, kind of, re- I mean, that's, that's essentially the story of, I mean, from the moment that God invited Adam and Eve to say what happened, I, I say this, the, whenever, whenever God says, where are you? It, I, I believe is it was Dr. Wilda Gaffney in her book, Womanist Midrash. Um, she said that when he says, where are you? It can actually be interpreted as where are you both? So God could be saying, where are you both? Um, And the first rupture, kind of relational rupture between Adam and Eve, or maybe not the first, but one of the first, it's up there, is when Adam responds with I. So it's no longer a we situation. It's no longer us. It's me against her. So the fact that women aren't, I mean, for me, it's almost like an argument that I don't, I am, I am, I don't know if the language, I am just egalitarian to the max. I have no problem with women preaching. I have no desire to be a woman preacher just to clear the air, but I have no problem with women teaching. I will also say that women are like human beings too. And so I, I gen generally tend to caveat again, that Women can misuse power. We've seen like stories of women who have also committed abuses of power or spiritual abuse in their own congregations. And so I don't think women are more or less inclined to do it. But I think that because of our general human anthropology, um, men subjugating and dominating women is a part of our story. 
And oh gosh, there's like this news. Have you been following the news about some sort of conference with men? It was just all men and how there was like a debacle that happened. Some stripper came or something, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, and, sword throwing and yeah. yes. Yeah. Oh, and I can't remember. I think it was a guy named Rick um, with Baptist News. I can't remember his name and I'm so sorry that I didn't catch his last name, but this isn't my idea. It was Rick's. It's I read it from him. Essentially that when there's no one in a crowd or a group to force to be submissive and they use the Barbie movie as a, as a illustration when you can no longer subjugate Barbie and it's just a bunch of Ken's, the Ken's start turning in on one another. Well, they start fighting one another, just like they did in the Barbie movie because subjugation and domineering domination, like that is almost in the DNA of our human anthropology. I think it's trauma. It's not, it's not faithful. It's traumatic. And they start fighting with one another. Um, and I would say, yeah, I sense that. And I sense that we hide it behind a, a doctrinal claim that I, I think is pretty weak. And even, even if that was, you know, something that the church believed in, why does a secondary issue have to be almost ultimate to everything else? It's almost like that is the litmus test that we use to gauge anyone as a believer. Like instead of considering someone like they believe in the deity of Christ and that he died and rose again, you know, these major tenets, these creedal statements, instead of looking for those things for belonging, we, I think it's so, I'm trying not to trivialize it. I do think it's a little silly that we look for, are you complementarian? Do you ordain women? You ordain women. We need to excommunicate you from our denomination. It just seems bewildering to me when that was not at all modeled in the scripture. It's not the behavior we see in Jesus. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you and I can't 100% say that there's more happening behind the scenes but if that if that inherent subjugation submission under the guise of faithfulness to doctrine is like the door through which one has to walk to belong i would say you're already and this is a hard word to use but i would say you're already being groomed for any other subjugation domination that also is not faithful as well wisdom Okay. Cognitive dissonance. Mm. The way you quote it is what we experience when we hear about light and truth on Sunday, but witness shadow and deceit throughout the week. What should we do when we experience that? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Do, wait, do you have more? I feel like I cut no, you off. No, that okay. was it, sister. I <laughs> Oh gosh. Um, it's such a big question because that's the sort of confusion. It's you're trained to go to the people who are in authority over you to help make sense of this confusion. But who do you go to when people, the, when the ones discipling you are the very ones who are causing the confusion, the chaos. What does it mean when a, when a shepherd who's supposed to be fostering shalom fosters this dissonance and this incongruence? I, I would say if you feel that, and it's so hard because it's contextualized, I would say the first thing you need to do is slow down because I mentioned this, I know this quote is in the book, Disre no, dysfunctional systems thrive on dysregulated nervous systems. So that, yes. there are, a dysfunctional leader will keep poking at you and prodding you to emote in the ways that they would like so that they can elicit a certain response from you. So I'm I'm thinking about, you know, like, Think of a schoolyard bully who keeps poking you, like, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, you know, and you're like, and you go off and you say, stop touching me. And it's almost like this sadistic, like, I enjoy watching this person squirm. But in the church, we've 
Um, something Jamar Tisby, I just saw, I saw Jamar Tisby at a, a conference that I was in, and he said this in regards to racism, but I think it applies to all um, toxic abuse of power, everything. But he says racism doesn't go away. It adapts. So sin and misuse of power doesn't ever go away. It adapts. And so that schoolyard bully who pokes and prod you, like what, what happens when that person's behind the pul pulpit and they start using God's name to poke and prod you in ways to, and so you get so dysregulated, you start to feel kind of squirmy within your own body. Um, I say that whenever I am kind of thinking, and I start to, I call it tail spinning. I just feel like I'm losing control and I get kind of a squirrely brain. I know that that is a sign for me to slow down and if anything, take a few breaths and essentially do what I need to do to kind of go back to the beginning, like what we were talking about, name what's happening. And I, I am no longer giving this person who somehow is bent, like benefiting from me being in chaos. This person no longer has the, I'm not giving them permission to name things for me. They don't get to tell me like it is because they've been a part of causing this chaos. And so it's hard to rely on your discernment when you feel like you've been made to be so undiscerning about someone you love. And so really, it's not a quick fix. This doesn't really fix much of anything, but slow down and give yourself. This is I've learned this phrase. I've said it to so many people. Um. I'm not, I'm, I hope you will give me space, but for people who display harmful behavior, toxic behavior, they are not going to give you space to work things out so that you can be mentally well. So I will say, if you won't give me space, then I am giving myself space because I am not in a place right now to engage with you and you no longer have permission to speak into that into that for me. So I will give myself space. And usually a part of that is I seek out other like trusted friends who will hold space with me to help me kind of piece apart. Sometimes that, that person is a therapist. Sometimes that person is just a friend who is in it with you, but give yourself space because cognitive dissonance starts taking up all the space within you. And again, remember we, we need to get away from the storm to start naming these things and cognitive dissonance is a storm that makes the grace and sin so confusing. And so I would just say, um, find your space to kind of discern these things. Jesus does not poke and prod you um, if you are confused and he's not asking you to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. He's not whipping you around, um, especially if you're hurting and for hurting and ill people, he did not like push them around. And so funny that's ken ken from barbie's favorite song is i want to push you around and um and so often we experience people in the pulpit who are like that but jesus was never like that with wounded people and so if your pastor or shepherd or leaders or even close friends won't give you space start asking yourself what does it look like to give myself space in this moment and if i'm trying to love my neighbor as myself how do I practice self-compassion now for me so that I can better extend compassion to my neighbor? I might cut this from the interview, but I got a question, another question. Thing. No, if we, if you, if you want to leave it in, you can leave it in too. Well, you talk about in the book where you labored alongside other people that saw what was happening. Mm -hmm. They even communicated with you that they saw that it was wrong and yes. that it was happening. And yet you take a stand and you truth tell and you get cut off mm. from those same people that saw that behavior. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? Oh, cry. I raged privately. I, these people were friends. Um, and I think I share that in the book also, like they are people, you know, when um, your phone says, hey, on this day, eight years ago. Yes. Oh my gosh. It's become my least favorite thing it's in the world. Brutal. It's brutal. So brutal. 
And so part of me is like, man, can you not? Like, how do I turn this off? Um, Those people were, some of some of them or their wives or their spouses were there when my kids were born or they were the, like they were friends and when they say we see what you're seeing and we're telling you that i i would get i would get confusing advice from multiple people some i remember one pastor and friend telling me and when i say pastor and friend um, the oldest one was nine years older than me. So like old enough to be your brother. I'm not talking about like me duking it out with like an 80 year old man. I mean, <laughs> not that I would like physically duke it out with an eight, but I, I would certainly but like these were peers. These were brothers. And one of the one of them were, was just a year older than me. You know what I mean? Like the like, come on, man, like we are the same age and we are navigating this together. And I would get disjointed advice from one that says, you need to continue to go speak to the pastor and essentially asking me to take on a shepherding role of my pastor in a complementarian church. So asking me to do something that technically you don't believe I should do or be paid to do, but to do this, to coddle him, to keep reminding him that he's hurting you, keep going to him. And I did, and I did, and I did. And that piece of advice kept hurting me because I was forced to continually go to this unsafe man who would keep twisting my words, who it essentially that fragmented also. But then there was another pastor who said, you need to stop speaking up. But it was more framed as a your voice to this conversation is not helpful rather than this pastor can no longer hear you. And that's his stuff. That's, that's on him. That's not on you. It was never, it was fra- to be so confused by people and to tell me for them to tell me it was love. It was so disjointed. So I think that for people who are navigating that, and I mean, for what I did with it, I, I had to, gosh, And these were men who I thought, like, do you approve of me? Do you see the leader I am? I wanted to be seen. I wanted them to see and identify. And I think they did. But I couldn't be controlled or couldn't be tamed is how I tend to put it. Um, To them, I was harsh and abrasive because those are actual words that were used against me. And just for communicating the truth. And it's really hard when they see it, too. Um, I will say. I was never really given a reason for my informal off ramp. I assumed it's because I kept speaking up when they wanted me to stop speaking up. I did receive. um, So I say, what what do I do with all of that? Um, I just stand in the truth of knowing what I did do, not their interpretation of the event, but I did receive just a few months ago. It took four years to hear that I was let go. Um, because they needed to fire or let go of our former pastor slowly. And I wouldn't let them go slowly. And I was there for three years. And I thought, what's slowly enough? And you're letting this man preach grace and truth from the pole, like actually sowing in this cognitive dissonance, not only with our staff, but with the whole congregation. Because when they did eventually need to let him go, the congregation is so confused about this is our pastor. He preached at us. And now it's so confusing to hear that he's been kind of unkind or ungenerous at minimum behind the scene. Like they couldn't reconcile that, but because we had the, the staff had let everyone believe everything was fine behind this. It was just confusing. And so I don't know. I think, what do you do with that? You lament it. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think God looks down and is looking at this sort of behavior from wherever he is, or like, I don't think he's standing next to us in his spirit thinking this is going off like the, exactly the way that I wanted it to go off in my church. Like this is, the, and I think he's lamenting it. He's essentially, you know, forgive them. Like we, it's what Jesus cried from the cross, forgive them father. They know not what they do. And they're, we're doing so many, the church is doing so many things in God's name thinking this is what it takes to give God glory. And I I look at it now and I think, forgive them, Father. They really don't know what they do because they've convinced them 
themselves that this is okay. And I don't know, we just lament. I think they're, I think we're going to be entering in a long season of lament. And I think sometimes that lament's going to look like anger. Sometimes it's going to look like just grief and sadness. But yeah, at minimum, I hope we can lament. If anything I've learned from you, it's learning how to lament. And I appreciate that deeply. As we close, is there anything you didn't get to say that you'd like to say? And then could you, uh, you, you have given us great tips. It's safe space, lament, speak truth, truth telling. Is there anything else, um, just practical advice that you would give to someone that's experiencing um, this maybe cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. or the pain of realizing that the people that they thought that they've come to trust aren't really who they are as we close out? I would say that do what you need to do to learn that you matter. If if God came to save us, then what about me is worth saving? What does he see that is worth saving, that is worth healing, that is worth mending? There's something in you that's worthy and good and beautiful. Um, there's something in you that God delights in. And I think whenever we're suffering in so many of these ecclesial contexts, we forget that. We are just pulverized to believe we're not enough, we're not smart enough, we haven't done enough. Um, and sure, sometimes some people might say, well, we aren't enough, Jesus is enough. Great, that's fine, but there's something in me that is worthy of being seen. Find the people and surround yourself with the people who are willing to see you as someone who is worthy of your time, their time, their energy. Um, and our whole, our whole, I, I, the whole commandment is summed up in loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. You, we will never be able to appropriately love our neighbors as ourselves if we don't love ourselves. Um, and not in a you know arrogant way, but no, I am worthy of love. And because I know this within inside, like within the inner part of my being, and I have that security, I can extend that safely to others without thinking this is a zero sum game, and I need to hoard this love and this pride. And I, I think it's just giving yourself more space to let yourself become whoever God is creating you to be. And sometimes we don't have that space to become. So, yeah. That's good. How would you feel about praying for anybody that has been othered? Yeah, I can absolutely do that. Thank you. Um, let me, could I actually read a prayer? I wrote this prayer for a writing group um, and I'd love, love to read it. Okay. Creator God, you know my core. You know how to integrate what has disintegrated in me. Grant me space to become that I might behold the wonder of all things before me. Grant me wisdom to see that I might no longer be blinded by the noise and chaos of life. Grant me the security to know that I may acknowledge my limits and establish new boundaries. Grant me a heart of hope that I might find peace among the pieces. Ground my ambition, that I might never fly too close to the sun. Goad me into holy discomfort, that I might grow and expand in the multitudes I am. Give me the courage to be unmade, so you might make me new. Guide me home, that I might find shalom in you. Amen. Give me the courage to be unmade so that I can be made. Ooh. Oh, I know that one. That one gets me too. That's the, that's where, yeah, that's where something hitches inside of me. Thank you for your gift of writing. Thank you. Thank you for your study. Thank you for your pain. It's got such a profound purpose. Mm -hmm. And I uh, look forward to your book launching. Where can people find you? Where can people find your book? 
Yeah, I am mostly on Instagram. I am also on threads. I have more or less abandoned Twitter or whatever we're calling it um, these days. But if people really want to read more about um, what I'm writing or kind of updates on life in general, even the things that I'm newly researching, I do believe that a holistic faith exists. And that's kind of my research now. Like, what does it look like to pursue a holistic faith that does not fragment people? Um, they can find me on Substack. So Um But yeah, thank you for having me on. This is wonderful. Thank you for being on. And we will link everything in the show notes. Great. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. If you found this to be helpful, will you help us get the word out about this podcast? I would be so honored if you would share it with your loved ones, rate it, review it, and also be sure to subscribe. And lastly, and I really mean this, we want to hear from you. If you have suggestions or ideas on something that I should cover or a tip that you'd really like help on, please send us an email, podcast at fearlessunite.com. Again, that's podcast at fearlessunite.com. Thank you so much for listening.